Welcome to the New South Wales State Archives webinar on the Bubonic Plague Register. Firstly, we do an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Oh, I think that just moved forward by itself. Um, okay, so the plague that appeared in Sydney in 1900 was part of the third bubonic plague pandemic that began in Yunnan in China in 1855. There was a huge demand for minerals from this area at the time, such as copper, and this brought a lot of people to that area just here in Yunnan. The increase of population brought people into contact with plague infected fleas that lived there and plague infected fleas and rats were brought back to urban areas as people traveled to and fro. Then the plague began to appear in other Chinese provinces such as Canton as people moved around even more. So here's Yunnan there. In 1895, there was 1894, sorry, there was a major outbreak of the plague in Canton, and this rapidly spread to Hong Kong, which is here, via the daily water traffic. And then from Hong Kong, which is a major port back in 1894 as it is today, the plague spread to India and then all other inhabited continents over time. So it went round to India and other places as well. The plague was spread from Hong Kong by ocean going trade, transporting infected people, rats and cargoes that all harboured fleas. It led to more than 12 million deaths in China and India alone. The World Health Organization considered the plague pandemic to be active until 1960. The plague in 1894, bacteriologists isolated the responsible bacterium, which is called Yersinia pestis, and determined that the common form of transmission of this bacteria was the flea. Symptoms of the plague were th included things like swollen lymph nodes, fever, chills, headaches, fatigue, muscle aches and pain, coughing, nausea, vomiting, diarrhoea, delirium, and as we know, death. Here we have a lovely picture of the flea. Um, the role of fleas was de demonstrated in 1898 and the work of Demonst this demonstration led to treatments such as insecticides, antibiotics and plague vaccines. So transmission of the bacteria happens when a flea bites an infected host, becoming infected itself. The bacteria blocks the flea's stomach and when that flea bites a mammal, the bacteria is injected into that mammal's bloodstream. It's being noted that any serious outbreak of plague in humans is preceded by an outbreak in the rodent population. When there are less rodents around due to the outbreak and their deaths for the fleas to feed on, they seek other sources of food like peoples. In New South Wales by 1897, the Board of Health was considering whether to take action concerning the plague. It was decided that as the quarantine system was robust enough to exclude smallpox, it would also prevent any plague entering Australia. At the same time, however, authorities started to take record of imports arriving in the country from Indian ports. By the end of 1898, the board was discussing whether they should send a doctor to India to study the clinical aspects of the plague and the dangers of rats. During 1899, the plague drew ever closer to Australia with outbreaks all over the place, for example, in the Transvaal, Mauritius, Jeddah, Alexandria, Egypt. So a lot of port cities and then spreading inwards from there. By December of that year, 1899, the plague had arrived in New Caledonia. So that stepped up the alerts in New South Wales because that's quite close and a lot of ships travel from New South Wales to New Caledonia. Ships arriving from Noumea were quarantined for 12 days and fumigated. At the same time, 
the Board of Health was seeking permission from the government to bring the plague bacillus samples to Australia for study, and these requests were not granted. But by early January 1900, there were reports of plague in South Australia. It wasn't long after that that the first case of plague appeared in New South Wales in Sydney. So on the 23rd of January 1900, Arthur Payne was reported to have symptoms of what could be plague. And this was confirmed two days later. Arthur's entire household of seven were relocated to the quarantine station and two contacts of the household had also been sent there for observation. Arthur's house was closed and disinfected. The public were notified of the case. The board then directed that all people connected with wharves and storehouses should be informed that rats were a great danger of infection and that the public should keep a watch for rats in their neighbourhoods and for any unusual sickness dead rats were to be boiled. So what you're seeing here is an extract of the minutes kept by the Board of Health and they discussed the cases of the plague as they appeared. Before this happened they were also discussing um, plague around the world and where it had been found and what action should be taken here in New South Wales. Um, and the Board of Health continued from 1900 to 1908 to discuss the plague, how to deal with it, how to quarantine and what should be done. So here we've got quite a detailed account of what they did for Arthur Payne. Um, and then also on this same couple of pages here, you can see they're talking about a steamer up at Newcastle. And then on the right hand side there, halfway down, they're talking about letting some of the Payne family out of quarantine. So this is on the 20th of February, so nearly a month after Arthur Payne was diagnosed. So while Arthur and his family were lucky enough to go home and his wife and daughter were compensated for loss of income during quarantine, it wasn't long before the plague claimed its first death in Sydney. Thomas Ridley Dudley, a 48 year old sailmaker, died of the plague on the 23rd of February. All of his household and employees were sent to the quarantine station of which you see a sketch here. Uh, meanwhile, the Board of Health recommended a systematic description destruction of rats along the wharves and notified the inhabitants of this action. Here we've got another extract from the Board of Health Minutes uh, talking about the quarantine of plague infected houses. So in March 1900, the Premier directed that the quarantine of all houses where plague was discovered and the removal of occupants, all occupants, to quarantine. Residences and places of work were disinfected inoculation was offered first to those in infected households and then provided to all contacts immediately on arrival to the quarantine station. Clothes and personal effects were disinfected on arrival. It was felt that Darling Harbour was the origin of infection in Sydney. On the 23rd of March 1900, Darling Harbour was proclaimed as a quarantine area, which meant that no people, vessels or boats could enter the area. And there's quite a few proclamations in the New South Wales Government Gazette from this time period relating to the plague as they're proclaiming action or they're proclaiming areas of quarantine and that kind of thing. So you can sort of chart a bit of the movement and what the government's doing in response to that movement to the plague through these proclamations. Here we have some information about the treatment of coastal steamers. So coastal steamers were fumigated on arrival to Darling Harbour and again after loading to prevent the carrying of rats to other ports. So they were very concerned that the plague would spread up and down the coast of New South Wales. So they were trying to prevent that. The Premier directed to the Mayor of Sydney that he should attend to the rat infested conditions of the wharves. Although the board considered evacuating the coast hospital for further plague cases, they decided at that stage to continue using the quarantine station, which could be supplemented with tents and other temporary structures if required. And we don't seem to have a lot of photos of the quarantine station, but they do have some on the National Archives of Australia website. And you can see built structures like um, 
houses and buildings and things, but then there are also tents. I don't know how you would feel about that, being a plague sufferer in a tent in quarantine in February or March in Sydney. I don't know that it would be that pleasant. So the register, we hold a register of cases of bubonic plague and this covers the years 1900 to 1908, which is pretty much the period that plague is in New South Wales. It documents the names and residences of those suffering from the plague and their fate. So whether they died or whether they recovered from this fearful disease, there are 592 people listed in the register. The register has been indexed and is digitised on our website. So if you go to our online indexes page and then go to B for bubonic plague and then click on that bubonic plague there, you'll find the index here. You can search the index by clicking on the search box up there or you can just browse on the register by going down the bottom here. So my first search that I did, of course, was to look for Arthur Payne, our patient that we'd already discussed. Uh, so he's the first entry in this register, our 33 year old wharf labourer, and we can see him listed here as number one. And his date of report was the 20th of January, 1900. And we also get the page number that his details appear on. So I can go back to my plague register and I can see the first page of the register here. If I blow the entries up so you can actually read them, you'll see we've got Arthur Payne. Uh, he was found at 10 Ferry Lane, Dawes Point. Um, he worked at Central Wharf where he was diagnosed to the staff where that diagnosed him. Um, and then on the second half of the entry page there, you can see that he recovered. He was discharged on the 17th of February and his occupation as wharf labourer. We also see here Thomas Ridley Dudley, who was 47 to 51 Sussex Street in Sydney, um, last employed on the 17th of February. And here we've got him passing away on the 23rd of February, as did the next few cases as well. You can see them all listed there, died, died, died. So if we go back to our index, we can do a search on another surname. Um, this time we've brought up the search for the Dovey family. And again, this is quite early on in the plague in New South Wales. So we're looking at March 1900 and we're looking at a father, I would say, and four of his children. So Elsie, James, Frederick and Harry. So if we have a look at the plague register, we can see all of their names here. So we've got Frederick, he was actually the first member of the family to be diagnosed. Then we see Elsie who was nine and Harry who was five, Reginald who was seven and dad James who's 41. Now they were all in the quarantine station, so they're all there by this stage but Frederick had been taken to the hospital where he'd been diagnosed. And he sadly, at the age of two, he passed away on the 9th of March. So three days after he was diagnosed, the rest of the family sent to quarantine on the 8th of March where they were diagnosed. And then by April, they'd all recovered and were released from quarantine. So one passed away, the baby sadly, but everyone else managed to recover, which was good news. We can also search the index by a locality. So this time I've picked the Criterion Hotel where there was a bit of an outbreak. So we've got Criterion Hotel in the city. We've got some actresses, a pantryman, a housemaid, and some other people who were all diagnosed in 1902. So this is a couple of years after. The plague is still in Sydney and it's still around in February of that year. And then if we look at the register entry for February 1902, we can see all of our people that we just saw in the index there. So some recovered, but we see here that our two actresses, Sally Booth and Ada Lee, both passed away. And Ada was quite interesting. I'd already done a little bit of research on Ada. So she was an English 
actress and she was here in New South Wales on tour. And so there is an intestate estate case paper file for her, um, which is looking at the fact that she'd passed away, that she didn't seem to have a will, that her family was in England. So there's communication between the public trustee or the curator of intestate estates here, back to England to work out what to do with her personal effects and things. And here we've got just a couple of documents from that file. So we see some details about Ada, where she was and where she was found and that she died of the plague. Um, we have several pages of belongings of Ada, just listing the sorts of things that she owned. So she had her large basket trunk with her 53 jackets and her 27 skirts and her seven petticoats, her cape, her aprons, her ulsters, her wrappers. Um, her median sized trunk with her four wigs and her, her clock and her petticoat, her skirts, more jackets, handkerchiefs, tights and so on. Um, ostrich feathers as you do. And what was really lovely was that we had this wonderful photo of Ada there and that's on the right hand side of the screen. Now, another way that you can search again by location, I was interested in Redfern because there just seemed to be a lot of cases in Redfern. So I wanted just to see how many there were and were they connected by surname and that kind of thing. Um, so when I did a search on Redfern, I came up with four pages of hits. Now I can actually change the number of people that show up in the list on one screen. So I can change that from 10 up to 500. So I extended the number of people that could be on one page just by changing it from 10 to 200 or something. And then I could export that list into Excel or into PDF or whatever. And so I've clicked here to export that list into Excel. And I come up with a list like this in Excel. And then in Excel, I can manipulate that data. So I can sort that data by surname or by occupation or by where found um, to find out different things about these people. So I was curious to see how many families seem to be listed. And it was interesting. I found very few people with the same surnames in the list. So to me that says possibly a couple of things. So while they might have quarantined the family in those, um, the inoculation that they did on arrival into quarantine was probably really helpful in preventing the spread of that disease. Um, so you might get one or two people with the same surname or one or two people from the same address, but it doesn't seem apart from the Dovey family that there were lots of families where multiple people were affected. A couple maybe, but not necessarily more than that. Um, and that's certainly borne out here by our search on Redfern. Um, when you did a search by address here, we can see that we've got Ellen O'Brien and Elsie Dibley who were, oh, I beg your pardon, no, yes, they were in the same house, the same address at, um, no, I beg your pardon, they were not. Forget what I said here, we've got Lillian Conyers and Alice Lawler who were in the same address. Um, but there's not that many really. We've got Minnie Millard and David Wilkins in the same house there. But a lot of different addresses once you look through the list there, it's quite interesting. Now the other thing too is that the index also is included in our collection search catalogue. So this is another way you can search the index. And that's what I've done here. So I've gone to collection search from our homepage and just entered the search terms bubonic plague Grafton, because it's useful, I think, to know that they weren't successful fully in containing the plague in Sydney and it did move up and down the coast. So there are cases at Grafton and Ballina, Newcastle, for example, Ulmurra. Um, so the, case, the plague did get out. So I can do a search, say, on bubonic plague Grafton up the top there, and then I can filter that search just to look at entries from the index. And that's what I've done here. So I've entered my search terms. I've then ticked my box next to bubonic plague index just to limit what I'm looking at to just those entries. And then I click on apply filters. And when I do that, 
I get these search results here. So I get a list of five people who were all listed as having the bubonic plague in Grafton. And then I can go from there back to the bubonic plague register, which is linked to the actual index page. It's possibly helpful to have them open on two tabs at the same time. So here we have our Grafton people um, and Percy Clark, who was our, one of our people on our previous page there, here, occupation farmer. Here he is, he's the first case for January 1905. And if I just blow that up so you can read it, you can see that a little bit better there. He's Clarence River, South Grafton, Lower Almara. And then we have another case in Almara, Cowper, Almara, South Grafton, Almara, Almara, Ballina, Balmain. So it wasn't that they were able to contain it in Sydney, unfortunately. And you can see over here that Percy was quite lucky, but then some of the few people who subsequently contracted the plague did pass away from the plague. Now, the Board of Health undertook a variety of measures to defend the state against the plague. And these included things like extermination of rats, the cleansing and disinfecting of premises and quarantine areas, distributing free disinfectant and rat poison to people, quarantining cat contacts, and inoculation was also offered to people who were in immediate contact with plague cases, including healthcare workers, so the nurses and those people. Um, they did only have limited supplies of the inoculation in Sydney, in New South Wales. Um, the one that they were using was something called half kinds prophylactic. And so it was so limited that when New, New Zealand had asked for some supplies, they had to write back and say, look, we're so sorry, don't have any, but the next time we get some in, we will send you some. Um, so you would be inoculated in the arm and there were side effects to the vaccine, including malaise, fever, a hard lump and swelling at the site of the injection. But it does seem to have been mostly effective. A small number of the people who were inoculated contracted the plague, but usually they had very light symptoms and they made a full recovery. So it did work, um, but they didn't do everybody. They just did limited people. So it was the people who were in contact. They quarantined the wharves, as we've seen at Darling Harbour, for example. Ships would be quarantined and fumigated, and they improved sanitation practices wherever possible, as possible. Uh, here we've got from 1902 some regulations. So they were very, very big on regulations and very concerned with vessels, of course, entering into the Sydney ports. Um, and then how they were to be quarantined, how they were to be cleaned, um, and then details of cargo and what to do with that and how to get rid of the rats and all of that sort of thing. So you can just imagine what it would have been like. Um, another thing that they did was to trace the course of the plague in Sydney on large scale maps. And what they found that it was that it was quite clear that rats preceded the outbreaks of the diseases. So here we've got this map, which was in the back of votes and proceedings for 1903. Um, and it's comparing cases in 1900 and 1902 and where they were. And so you can see that there's a lot of plague around Sydney in both of those years, and it does spread outwards. Remember, there's only 592 cases over eight years, so it's not complete red dots everywhere, but it is, quite consistent with it being that sort of wharf lifestyle kind of association. Okay, so here we have a photo that you've probably all seen before, or most of you may have. Um, these are our professional rat catchers. So 3,000 men were employed at the height of the epidemic in 1900 to catch and kill rats and they were paid per rat for each one killed and the rates varied over time. Um, in the Board of Health, it's quite interesting. They do have information about how much 
people were paid. Uh, so they raised the payment in April 1900 to six pence from two pence per rat. Um, and then in 1901, there's quite a cute little argument that's breaking out between the Board of Health versus the Premier and the Treasurer. And the Premier and Treasurer felt that the function of overseeing the rat killing should be taken on by the Board of Health instead of Public Works. The Board of Health was thinking, no, that's not really very good because they didn't have the facilities such as the clerical staff, the room, the general machinery and the funds to enable it to do this um, and they felt it should stay with the public works and they also did not want to undertake the function of harbour scavenging because that was well outside the scope of what it took care of. Thank you very much. So the more things change the more they stay the same is all I can say about that. Um, okay so photographs were taken of the cleansing operations in the cleansing area in the quarantine areas in Sydney between March and December 1900. Uh, these are a very popular source for people because they give us a wonderful look at what the rocks and those areas in inner Sydney looked like in the time and those not so attractive areas of inner Sydney that otherwise we may not have much of a record of what they look like. Um, so the cleansing operations were unsupervised by George McCready and McCready noted that where it was necessary to pull down a premises or destroy outbuildings, photographs were taken of them before their demolition and in order to prepare in case of future litigation, each inspector was instructed to take careful notes of any property that might be destroyed. So here we have the rear of 405 Pitt Street I'd say they've possibly gone through and cleaned that because the ground looks really swept and really quite pristine. Here we have the rear of 36 Owen Street, looking a little bit more ramshackle, I would say. And here we have the interior of a kitchen in George Street, possibly not one that you'd want to eat from today. Uh, the photographs were taken by Mr John Dagatardi who was a photographer from the Department of Public Works and the photographs are largely of buildings that were requiring to be de demolished and include interiors and exteriors of houses, stores, warehouses and wharves, surrounding streets and lanes and yards. So they do give us that really clear indication of the state of the city during and immediately after the plague. So here they've just demolished a, a house at Exeter Place. There's a lot of people working on that. Uh, here we've got some cleansing operations taking place up Sussex Street there. So it's a lovely view of Sussex Street, though it does look rather clean. And here we have a picture of them actually cleaning the streets in Sydney. It's just amazing to look at Sydney without all that traffic that we're so used to now. Uh, here we've got 82 Campbell Street which to me looks like it has been cleaned um, and one of my favourite things about the photos are the people who are in them. So there are some great photos with, which have just obviously the residents standing out there in the street looking at this camera. So it's quite interesting to see the funny looking kids and the adults. It's just just wonderful. And the views cover the whole of the quarantine area which stretched from Millers Point to George Street, Argyle Street, Upper Fort and Essex Streets, then to Chippendale, covered the area between Darling Harbour and Kent Streets, went out to Cowper Street at Glebe, along City Road, um, and then also the area east from George Street, enclosed by Riley, Liverpool, Elizabeth and Goulburn Streets, um, and also Woolloomooloo, Paddington, Redfern and Manly, parts of those suburbs were also quarantined as well. Here we've got um, some rubbish at Smith's Wharf um, and what was striking to me about this was just all the smoke in the background all up here. Such a smoky, smoky place. 
um, but you can see them madly cleaning the wharves there. And here we've got them constructing the rat proof wharves at Darling Harbour after the outbreak of the plague. So I think they've had to do some smart work there to try and mitigate the advance of rats through the area. And we also have another view of the reconstruction of Darling Harbour there um, and some sailing ships in the background. So by 19, and this is a new wharf um, that had been reconstructed, so it's not actually finished yet. You can see there's a lot of building mess in the front there. And we see the, the new ship, the first ship coming in. Um, and then we see the little steamer launch here at the front, the Premier. So this is 1903. So they did get onto a pretty quick smart. So by 1908, there's still plague in New South Wales and they're still dealing with creating rat proof areas throughout the city. So here we've got in February 1908, they're looking at rat proof floors in suburban produce stores. Uh, there's reports that the plague in New Caledonia had ended and that Numea was free from plague, but Queensland still had two cases running at that time. Um, and then in February, there's a fatal case reported from Kempsey, a 16 year old girl there. Um, some other people were discharged. They were still finding plague infected rodents. So they're reporting those. Um, and then in March again, we've got another case, more reports of plague infected rodents, more deaths, more plague rats and so on. So they just really can't get rid of these rats, unfortunately. Um, and Darling Harbour, despite the rat-free wharves, was still rat infested. Now the plague continued to appear in Australia till 1910. Um, Australia fared really well compared to other nations, nations. So the approach that we saw in New South Wales to combating the plague using public health as a channel, including that sanitation, the quarantine, the inoculation and the science they used to develop those measures was really successful overall and provided an example to the rest of the world. Now, other places and other sources to find out more information about this time um, that are helpful are the Board of Health extracts from their minutes, which is what I've used, all those TypeScript pages that you saw were the extracts from the minutes and it's quite a thick volume. So there's a lot of minutes talking about a lot of things that happened with the plague and what they did at that time. Um, Votes and proceedings of the Legislative Assembly for the years of the plague are also a really useful source. That's where my flea picture came from and also my bacteria picture. Um, and that's really handy because it includes a lot of details about symptoms um, and how those symptoms affected particular cases. So this happened to case number 432, this happened to case number 65, that kind of thing. Um, it talks about the vaccine and how effective it was. It talks, it's a very lengthy report and they reported most of the years of those, that, that plague outbreak. Um, and there's maps that we saw, that map that we saw earlier, that actually comes from the votes and proceedings. So if you're looking at votes and proceedings, you look under public health um, in the index and then there'll be a report listed and then you just go to the page number and each report is pages and pages and pages long. So that would be your most detailed source. Uh, Government Gazette entries as well um, for in Trove. So the National Library of Australia's Trove website, you can find New South Wales Government Gazettes there and you'll be able to see copies of the proclamations that were issued. Um, and the other place that I'd suggest, of course, would be newspapers of the day and that would give you more of that personal reaction as well as reporting of events as they happened. Um, so I think Overall, there's a lot of information that you can find out if you are keen to do so. Um, I would like to thank you all for coming to today's talk of the plague. Um, I hope you found it interesting and I hope you've been able to learn something today. And I know I certainly did when I went into it. I did not realise, for example, that this outbreak of the plague started in 1855 and continued till 1960.